Welcome to the Women Leaders Association podcast, where we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. Be sure to tune in each week to hear an empowering message from the world's top women executives, trailblazers, entrepreneurs, and all around fierce female leaders. I'm your host, Julianne Kirkland, and I will be taking you on a deep dive of each message to equip you with the principles, strategies, and tools you need to start crushing your goals, increasing your impact, creating work-life harmony. And did I mention have more fun? Because when you love what you do, you do it better. The Women Leaders Association is the world's largest women executives association with over 30,000 women in executive and leadership positions who are committed to the development and advancement of women in the corporate arena. If you would like to get involved in a Women Leaders Association chapter, would enjoy daily podcasts, or you desire to become a part of the Women's Mastermind Group near you, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com. Now let's tune in for this incredible message. On today's episode, you will hear from Kristen Shane. Kristen is the Chief Merchandising Officer at PetSmart, with a history of working in retail, beauty, health, wellness, and fitness industries. Kristen is skilled in building high-performing teams to deliver exceptional results. Let's tune in as Kristen shares how to become the best, most effective leader. So there are five things. They're selfish. They're all about you. And if you do them, you will be a better leader. Let me tell you why. Here's the first one. Make movement a priority. Anybody know who that is? Yes, that's right. Kathleen Switzer. So this girl was like, oh yeah, women can't run the Boston Marathon, she just did it. And the photo after this is all of those police officers realizing she's a woman and like trying to take her down and she ran away from finished the Boston Marathon. Go Kathleen, thank you. Um, There has been a lot of research done about how we perform as leaders. In 2001, you guys should look this up. In 2001, Harvard Business Review published a study called The Corporate Athlete, The Makings of a Corporate Athlete. And what this study showed was that the best leaders, or to reach our full potential, we have to think about our careers, our jobs, how we show up every day, like athletes. Why? Well, let's just talk about athletes for a second. So athletes have a season, right? So they have one part of a year where they have to be at peak performance. And even in the season, They have like one game a week. And even in that game, it's like two hours a day where they're on and they have to deliver. They spend all year preparing for those two hours. And all year, they're thinking about what they eat, how they sleep, how they move, how they train, et cetera. It's a thing. It's proven there's a lot of science into it. Okay, let's talk about us. We wake up at What time did you get up? Anybody? 5.30. We wake up at 5.30 in the morning. If we're lucky, we did a little workout. It probably wasn't our best effort, but we checked the box. After that, we probably got dressed, and we probably got the kids ready. We probably packed lunch. We probably took them to school. Then after that, we probably drove to work. And then we were in meeting, 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 where we were on, 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 evaluated, evaluated. How is she? She looks tired today. I don't know. Is she? She's kind of bitchy. I don't know. Like, so all day, all day, all day, all day. Okay. So then we're done with work, and then we go home. We get the boys. We take them to hockey practice. We get feedback from the daughter that the tights weren't in the dance bag. Is that my job? I don't think that's my job. We take them to dance. We get them to dance. They do the thing. We take them home. We get dinner. On the way home, we maybe grab a rotisserie chicken because we didn't make anything for dinner. We get we unpack lunches. We repack lunches. We put all the bags together, and then we have like 14 seconds to have me time, and then we go to bed every day. 365. That's what we do, right? Am I right? Like even sort of right? Like it's close, right? That's what we do. We prioritize everybody else but ourselves. You guys, objects in motion stay in motion. Objects at rest stay at rest. I am going to ask you today to prioritize a movement practice, something. I don't care what it is. So I like to run. I go running. You, You might say to yourself, there's no way I'm running. Fine. Go on a walk. Walk the dog. Do yoga. Whether it's one minute or five minutes or 10 minutes, I want you to develop a movement practice, not just because of all of the health benefits associated. We all know that you, you, know, you have more energy, you sleep better, movement is the catalyst for making better decisions about diet, like all of the things that we already know, but having the discipline, not the motivation. Motivation is cute. I'm not talking about motivation. 
the discipline to say, every day when I get up, I'm going to do something. I'm not asking you to break a four minute mile, just do something, some kind of movement practice. That sounds easy. How do I do that? Well, there's a book called Atomic Habits. Have you guys heard of it? It's like so good. So if you haven't heard of it, download it on Audible because who has time to read a book, throw it in your ear pods. And when you're doing your movement practice, you're going to listen to it. But one of the things that James Clear, the author talks about is this idea of tiny habits and letting tiny habits be the motivator or the catalyst for the bigger thing. So for me, my tiny habit is every single day, every single day when I get up, I turn my alarm off, I walk into my closet, and I put my workout clothes on every day. I, I don't, my habit is not I go work out, my habit is I put my workout clothes on. Because how awful is it? to take the workout clothes off when they're not sweaty to get ready. You're like, oh, I just put my workout clothes on. And then you can't not do it. You cannot not do it. Four tips for making movement a priority. Start where you're at. Do not go sign up for a marathon. Don't go think you're gonna do a Ragnar. Just start where you're at. If you don't have a movement practice today, fine. Do something, five minutes, start there. Just start where you're at. I'm not asking you to revamp your life. I'm just saying, start where you're at prioritize yourself. Number two, consistency over everything. Consistency over everything. Not intensity, not how much, consistency. I don't have time today. Yes, you do. Do you have three minutes? Okay, fine. Do 20 burpees. Call it a day. Okay? Consistency over everything. Streaks matter. Like, we know this. Number three, I talked about tiny habits. You can use mine if that's helpful for you. If it sounds awful, then you don't have to use mine. Um, but discipline over motivation. In, in the movement practice world, in the fitness world, people talk about motivation. I just articulated what our days look like. If you open your eyes at 5.30 and you're motivated, I, like, please come take the mic from me and tell us your secret. It is not about motivation, you guys. It's about discipline. It's about discipline because you are prioritizing yourself, you're betting on yourself, and you know that if you do this movement practice, it will help you in the long run. So that's number one. Number two, make space for dreaming and thinking. This is so critically important, so critically important. Why? Because our days are so packed. And when we're in the packed day, we're like head down making decisions and we don't step back, put our heads up and make the, broad, the bigger decision, the more strategic decision, the bigger leadership decision. And so making space in your day, even if it's only three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, to just sit in contemplative thought is incredibly important. So for me, I do it when I run. You can do it, you can meditate, you can do yoga, you can do it on a walk, maybe you like to cook, whatever it is, make space for dreaming and thinking, but not just five minutes a day. So I want you to do that. But the other thing to think about is when things get crazy, it's the first thing that goes. And so Make time when things are crazy for bigger bursts of, of your ability to just sit in your own thoughts. So I'll give you an example. You know, one of my jobs at, at Target was to launch the Canada Initiative. So if you're not familiar with that, it did not go very well. So we opened 124 stores and then we closed 124 stores. And that's a whole different speech. But... It was crazy. I had three kids, one I had just given birth to, there was so much going on, and I was like not the leader I needed to be to be successful for my team, regardless of the chaos that was going on around me. And I sat down with my husband one day and I was like, I need something else to get myself out of the chaos that is work. And he was like, okay, well, let me know what that is. And so I randomly signed up for a baking class. And so every Saturday for four hours, I went and made cupcakes. Those four hours were an absolute game changer for me. And that experience was so chaotic. And when we came back, most of the people that went to Canada were let go. And I was the only one that wasn't. And I swear to God, it was for cupcakes. Because when I was in that class for four hours on Saturday, I could step out of my chaos and look at myself and go, that is not who I am. That's not who I need to be. From a leadership perspective, 
I don't want to be that. And so every week I got to reset and show up and reset expectations for my team, realign what success looked like, be the catalyst for optimism in a world where everything was falling apart and nobody else showed up like that. And so this is incredibly important for us to be successful and it looks selfish. Really, we're, we're like, the house is burning and you're baking cupcakes. Yes, I was. Every day through your movement practice, most importantly, when, you're get when things get crazy, schedule your PTO and use that time to think big. Number three, be yourself. So easy to say. Let me talk to you a little bit about this. So did you guys watch the US Open? Who knows what three words this goat said when interviewed, the interviewer says, are you surprised at your level of play? Do you guys remember what she said? Three words. I'm just Serena. Not like, oh, I have a really great team, or I've been working really hard, or I'm just grateful that it's cool out. Like, that's what we do. She literally said, I'm just Serena. Like, next question, name me someone who has had more scrutiny, who has had more people betting against her, who has gotten more criticism because she's too big, she's too black, she's too loud, she's too whiny, we don't like her outfits. And she literally rolled in and was like, I'm just Serena, unapologetically. Like talk about someone who is authentically herself. We have to use that as an example. And we have all had Serena moments where they have said, oh, she's a little too direct. She's kind of intimidating. She's too loud. She thinks we know it all. And so I'm not suggesting that you roll in and go, I'm just Kristen. But I am suggesting that you really think about who it is that you are and take the feedback and take the coaching. And one of the things that I learned through my career is we're going to get the feedback. It's up to us what we do with it. And so I was always told all of those things. You're too loud. You're, you have a big personality, you know, all of the things. And I went to a coach and one thing she told me was ticks on a dial. So I remember this. What does that mean? People are excited. When someone says to me, what's your superpower? Here's what I say. I can get anybody excited about anything. I can. Like, tell me the most mundane thing. I will get you excited about it. I don't know why. It's just something that I can do. You all have superpowers. That has what's made me successful. It's also what gets in the way sometimes when I'm in a boardroom and there are a million people there and they don't know who I am. Like, who's the girl in the leather pants? I don't know, right? So like, ticks on a dial. So I can be me. This is me. I am me to you. I look at you. I see the nodding. I'm like, I love you. We are, you are my people. But I can also roll into the boardroom and not do that. So I'm still myself. It's just I can turn the dial up or turn the dial down. So think about the feedback that you get. I'm not telling you to ignore it, but I'm telling you to think about it like clicks on the dial. That's selfish leadership. Be true to yourself. Create the culture and be intentional about the culture you want to create. This is so important. What are your values? Not your company's values, your values. People work for people, not companies. So you got to be clear about what your values are. If you asked my team, what are Kristen's core values? Here's what they would say. Accountability is her love language. That's what they would say. Every single one to a T. Accountability is her love language. It requires you to be vulnerable and shed the armor and just be clear about what you did and what you didn't do. Two, it requires you to tell the truth. And the truth is really important. Transparency is important. And number three, it allows to create an environment where we can fail, be honest about it, and still move forward. So accountability is my love language. What are your core values? Think about what your values are and then create the culture that you want to be. I happen to be the executive sponsor for the LGBTQ um, associate resource group because another one of my core values is I, I my why is to figure out how people get people to show up authentically themselves. Okay, the last thing, be a developer of talent. And so you may be sitting there going, well, that doesn't feel very selfish. Let me tell you why. The best leaders understand that it's people above everything else. It's people above everything else. And so as humans, what fills our cup? I already know the answer. You don't have to tell me. Every single one of you 
has your cup filled, when you feel like you have impact, when you feel like someone is successful because of what you did, when someone on your team says to you, thank you, I couldn't have done it without you. I didn't actually believe in myself, but I did it because I knew you believed in me. That is why we're here. That's why we have kids. Like that is what fills us up. And so don't resist the urge to do it all yourself. So how do you develop talent? Number one, we all know this is our most, most important job. Number two, delegate. So all of the amazing work you're doing, figure out how to reach down into your organization and pull people up to bring them along with you to help develop them working on the coolest stuff that you're all working on. Nelson Mandela said, lead from the back so that everyone believes that they're in the front. So think about how you pull people up from your organization and help develop them. And then lastly, don't fear the truth. Give them the feedback, bring them along. Don't make it awkward. Just tell them what they need to do to be better. So these are my five things. And, and I think a lot about that day in El Salvador when I got there with my arms spread and she took the picture and in my head, I was like, oh my God, what did I do? I hope today that you saw that, yes, betting on yourself is important, but there are five easy ways to do it. And if we do it every day, they, be, they end up being catalysts for our ability to be the, next, the, the best leaders we can. No Salvadoran hut required. Hey, hey, ladies, we are going to pause right there because it's time to go deeper. I love this concept of developing ourselves as corporate athletes based on the story of Roger Bannister, who was the world's first to run a mile in under four minutes after no one had ever done it before. And scientists didn't even believe it was possible. They didn't even believe it could physically be done. And then in our good old Raj, he trained his body and his mind. He visualized consistently what it would look like on that clock when he hit the finish line. He visualized it saying three minutes, 59 seconds. And that's exactly what he did. And then several months later, another man hit it. And then another, because they were able to see that it could be done. And there's so much power in believing what you're able to see. So this concept of training like a corporate athlete was born on Roger Sherbanister. I would even like to take it a bit further and say we should call it the influence athlete instead of the corporate athlete, because perhaps you too have noticed since 2020, more women are beginning to blur the line between the corporate world and the entrepreneur world and the work at home mom world. Who was it that said those all had to be so drastically different anyway? I think we are on the edge of a great awakening that is coming, that is here. And no, this is not a hashtag woke episode, but it's a needed conversation to have because I believe that we can be awakened to things and still hold grace for those that perhaps need a second cup of coffee if you catch my drift. So far in the early life of this podcast, we are covering topics on what it actually takes and what it actually looks like to be a woman of influence, because that's what leadership is. It's influence. It's nothing more and it's nothing less. It's not your title. It's not your pantsuit. It's not the number of social media followers that you have. It's not your email list. It's not even the zeros, the number of zeros that come after the comma on your paycheck. Our ability, or should I say, our willingness to resonate with someone should not be a result of the label that they hold. And thus far on this show, you have heard these women leaders saying the same thing. <sighs> okay. I got to take a minute because this topic gets me so heated. Helping women to truly grasp how much value they hold and how much value they have to contribute to this world to make it a better place. Y'all, oh, I'm so passionate about it. These conversations, we need more of them happening. But back to what Kristen was saying. In the now what I've dubbed as the 
influenced athlete, how we can become the best, most effective leader. We have to start by taking care of ourselves first. And she encourages us to develop a movement practice, these tiny little habits that we put into play matter. Kristen says she has created a habit of getting up in the morning and walking into her closet and putting on her workout clothes. Not she's created a habit of working out in the morning. You got to go smaller than that. First, she's got to put on her clothes. And then she talked about how when she doesn't do that, she doesn't feel good because she was like, I now I got workout clothes on and I don't get to take them off when they're all sweaty and I feel all accomplished because I didn't do my workout. But either way, whether she does the workout or not, her habit is putting on the workout clothes. She's developed that discipline and discipline is what leads to consistency. And I think we can all agree that what when we enjoy doing things, it's because we feel motivated to enjoy them, right? We feel motivated to do them, to accomplish them. But motivation isn't always there. And so perhaps when we don't feel motivated or in a good mood or the vibe isn't right, right? Perhaps we should stop relying on motivation to carry us through and actually start developing the discipline needed to move that needle forward. Because there's going to be days when you're like, oh, I'm so over it, but you, you don't get to be over it to get consistent results. You know what I mean? Like you can still feel that way, but discipline is going to kick in and you're going to do it anyway. And then you feel even better that you did it anyway, because placing your effectiveness in the hands of motivations and consistency, y'all, that is a death. It is certain death to your dreams, to your goals, to the big things that you want to accomplish in your life. Really focus on the little habits that you can start to implement and do consistently. You need discipline and discipline takes practice and support. Y'all, I set alarms for everything. And you might be thinking, really, Julianne, everything? Yeah, everything. I have forgotten my kids at school on more than one occasion. So yes, I set alarms for everything. And I put everything on my calendar too. My digital one, the one that I can color code and set alarms for digital. I have developed that discipline because relying on myself to remember, relying on myself to not leave a you know, handwritten planner in my car. Those things weren't working for me. Yes, I will still write stuff down on a sticky note, but if I don't put it in my calendar, my digital calendar, I don't know where the sticky note goes most of the time. I put it in my calendar. Even if it's not, like I will even go as far to do, make a, a note to call the vet. Like I don't even have to call the vet. But let's say like I have to schedule an appointment for my dog and I have to do it by Friday. Okay. I will put in my calendar to call the vet on Friday at two o'clock. But on Monday, when I'm planning ahead for my week on Monday, I will make the note in my calendar at two o'clock to then put the note in my calendar for Friday. Like You have to be that prepared thinking of all the little steps because otherwise things will fall through the cracks and you'll be like, oh man, I totally forgot that I needed to call the vet on Friday and here it is on Saturday and I will see Daisy. So yeah, I put everything in my calendar. (laughs) Okay. I had to figure out a system that was going to work best for me. Shifting to this discipline has created a beautiful pathway of consistency in my life. And consistency is king and getting the results that you desire. And all of my calendar talk, (laughs) it just goes to show that I fully align with what Kristen is saying in her next point, which is to schedule your time. She specifically talks about scheduling your PTO or your downtime and allowing this time to be the time you use to dream big, to set those big goals, right? Because you're in a better mind frame to do so. And I cannot stress this point enough. Girl, 
your capacity matters. I work with so many high achieving women that are excited and ambitious and big visionaries, but they're also extremely frustrated because they seem to be hitting a wall and that wall is their capacity. It's like trying to squeeze an orange through the opening of a water bottle. Their dream, their goal, that's what the orange is. Their capacity is that bottle. And when you are coming up against resistance and achieving your goal, pause and take a look at your capacity to actually manifest that goal. You cannot have level 10 dreams and level 10 goals with level two habits. And I've shared this before. I'm a mom of six kids and I love working. I love serving my clients. I love recording podcasts. I love speaking on stages. I love what I get to do and I do it well. And in the same regard, I had to become super truthful with myself about my capacity to do all the things that I love because I knew two things. I wasn't willing to compromise my time and energy with the things that matter most to me in exchange for the opportunity to work, even though I loved it. And I also knew that at the end of the day, if I did that, it was going to lead to resentment and burnout. Your dreams matter. Your goals matter. And so does your capacity to achieve them. And this also leads to the next point of being authentically you. Know what you stand for. I knew I was not willing to compromise on certain areas of my life. And I created new habits and routines that allow me to honor and prioritize those things first and then schedule everything else from there. And Kristen talks about how her coach helped her to adjust her zeal that she brought with her and to see it as ticks on a dial. She can turn it up and she can turn it down. And I do a lot of speaking and I have to deal with the same thing. You know, I have to know my audience and I have to pay attention to what they're responding with, what they're resonating with. It doesn't change my message. I am able to adjust my tone, my frequency, my pauses, all of those things while still speaking my message and staying true to who I am. It's, it's like when she talked about Serena Williams, right? Serena goes up to that interviewer and she's like, I'm just Serena. I mean, that's the greatest freedom is when you get to show up fully as yourself, no longer worried that you have to present yourself in a certain way that you have to have a facade uh, of what this position or this role or this label looks like, because that's what other people have said. And that's what other people have done. Be yourself. And I could spend an entire episode on just this one point, but I will keep us moving along. <laughs> but if this is an area that you need help with, if this is something is as we're having this conversation, you were like, yes. Oh, oh, I struggle with that. Reach out. You can reach out on Instagram at the women leaders podcast you can go to the womenleaderspodcast.com and we have coaching programs. We have networking programs. We have um, masterminds. We are there to encourage and support you to becoming the best version of yourself and living into your max potential. So just know that those resources are available for you. Okay. Moving on to Kristen's point number four, creating your culture. And all these points really do feed into each other because you can't create a culture of values and integrity and transparency if you are not able to show up fully as your most authentic self. I'm just saying like, that's, that's not a thing, right? You're really living non-integrous saying that you value integrity. So you have to be able to show up fully authentically as yourself first and then create a culture of what matters. And Kristen encourages us to, to create our culture around our core values and to be so clear when setting expectations and communicating these values. 
you don't want to force somebody into your culture that doesn't truly align with it and want to be there. You're just going to end up making both of you miserable and potentially others miserable. And point number five, develop talent. The best and most effective leaders know that it's people above everything else. Y'all, my favorite example of this truth is when you go to the grocery store and you have a handful of items and you can like quickly go through the self-checkout and you're like, oh, that's so convenient and so wonderful and yay, in and out. And then there's those times when you go to the grocery store and you have a buggy and it's overflowing and there's no standard cashier lines open. And you have to try and do all of that by yourself in the self-checkout line with everybody giving you the eye and you can't do it all yourself. It's like, hell no, not doing it. Y'all, I have left a full cart of groceries before because I'm like, there, nope, it's going to take too long. I'm going to be impatient. I don't, I'm not doing it. Not doing it. Give me the people. Give me the people. And if you have ever yelled representative <laughs> into a phone before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Automation is great for some things, but it's not for everything. People still matter. People still bring value that only people can bring. People still desire connection. Okay, I could go on that whole rabbit hole point as well, but I'm not going to. I don't have all day. (laughs) So develop those around you. If you see greatness in somebody, help to develop it. And while you're at it, tell them about it too. Sometimes people just need a word of encouragement to keep moving forward. Encouragement is like oxygen to our souls. And I think it was John Maxwell that said that. But so often people will live up to your expectation of them when you are encouraging them and you are believing in them and you see it for them and you are helping them to see it for themselves. It's huge. It's huge. Resist to do it all yourself. Develop those people around you. And I know we have all heard and often agree with that old adage of, you know, if I want it done right, I'm going to do it myself. Okay. But when you develop the talent around you, when you develop other people's strengths, and you delegate according to their strengths, that's fire. Okay, don't delegate according to their position, according to their title, according to their label. Delegate according to their strengths. Huge game changer, huge. There's a hot tip, both free right there, okay? All of these things, all of these things will help you to become the most effective leader. And remember, leadership is influence and it is to be shared. It's not a label to be worn. All right, my friends, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed today's episode, shoot me a message over on Instagram at Women Leaders Podcast and share with me your biggest takeaway. What will you begin to implement on becoming an influence athlete? I want to know because we truly believe We go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. And if you're wanting more, more connection, more support, more accountability, you got to go check out the Women Leaders Association membership. We have masterminds, networking opportunities. Simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com and see all the info there. All right, my friends, until next week. Bye for now.